Right, we're on the air. Tessa. Good morning, Mark. How are you? Very well, thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us for um, the immune region of TFT and its second outing. It's going to be a fabulous day. It's a wonderful day. And in fact, if we'd, uh, if we'd like to share the, the scenery with the audience, you can see that we're broadcasting from the Edgebaston Cricket Ground. In I Berlin. know, and almost the sun is trying to peep out behind those clouds. Well, they're, they're, in fact, there is a bit of sun, so that's great. That's wonderful. Good. And so um, I think Ian Aitchison has just closed off um, Oceana about 10 minutes ago, and that seems to fantastically. Excellent. And then we've got another kind of eight speakers lined up for today, two of whom um, are coming live from the SDR conference. So um, Rob England, session at, um, I think that's, uh, what time is that today? Paul Clark this afternoon is coming live from the SDR conference. And then Chris Dentz's session, Papa Thor, is also coming live from the SDR conference. So they're going to be incredible. And I think you have a panel joining you for your session this morning, do you? Yes, that's right. I've got some, I've rounded up some Dutchies. <laughs> to talk, to, yeah, to talk about uh, even one from Canada. Who's it's four, it's two o'clock in the morning at Canada. So oh, thank he's... you very much for getting up so early. Yeah, he's in his uh, way well, getting up. <laughs> he hasn't been to bed yet. Been to bed like, yet. You're not talking about Patrick, are you, by any chance? No. By the way, that's, that's Patrick. Just to. Uh, Good morning, uh, Mr. Bolger. How are you? Just to morning. Just to my left. Good. So we're Good. sitting together in this wonderful executive box, Edgebaston. Lovely. And Patrick, I believe, is going to facilitate your session for you this morning to give you an opportunity to present, and he'll um, field questions for you at the end. Heckle, you mean, does it? <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> I mean field questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Rotten tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that, and I'll field questions rather than... Yeah, yeah, okay. what, what, well, in that case, gentlemen, um, I shall bid you farewell and have a fabulous day. Yeah, have, um, fun at, have fun at the physical conference. I will have a great time at the physical conference and we shall merge later on this afternoon. Yeah, drop in from time to time. Say hello. Perfect. Good luck. We'll right. speak soon. Bye. Okay, bye. bye bye. Mr. Bolger. While, while I'm doing a little bit of technical stuff here, yeah. the necessary, you do your introductory stuff. Say something nice about me. Well, well, you're quite a clever guy. I've listened to you present before, so I, I do know you actually are relatively smart. So, so let's get that one on the phone. I'm, I'm, I'm not present. In fact, I'm, I'm really, I'm just introducing my wonderful panelists. Oh, is that it? This morning. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I'm just. So you're being, not going to heckle or anything. I'm, I'm being the MC. So you're being the MC. I'm in the MC for yeah, you're, you're introducing the MC. So, <laughs> you, so this is, hang on, you, you just you just rattle on about something while I... So uh, last time I heard you speak, you were going on about this BSL thing. Yeah, oh I yeah. The, yes. Most interesting thing. So I presume that that's taken off with a roar and thunder as we, one would expect. Yeah, well, you know, as you, as you know, it's very well known in the Netherlands. Indeed. And it's catching on in the in the States. Uh, ITSMF USA yeah. caught, on, caught on to it, which is very encouraging. Right. Uh, doing stuff in the UK, Scandinavia, uh, Asia. Um, I think we've covered about 15 or 16 countries up to now. So it's like plenty common of, sense for IT, isn't pl it? Plenty. Well, it's, the, the great thing about BISL is that it's, it's whereas we've got great guidance for, um, for the IT community, yeah. The, business the, the, poor, the poor business guys on the other side who have to have to deal with IT, you know, they um, what's their guidance? So that's what this, this framework's all about. Just excuse me when I while I do this technical stuff. Otherwise, I'm going to get sacked before I even start. So Mark might be breaking things now. If this was James Finister on the other hand, the whole hangout would have crashed in the library <laughs> because he that man can break technology like no one I've ever seen before. So, so have we got this panel. Well, we've got uh, Peter Leinzer, who's calling in from Canada. Um, was Peter hiding with a big glass of wine? Yeah, that's with, with his with his, ah. with his pajamas on. And I got uh, Dutch uh, cheese uh, here. Oh, well, wonderful! Oh, you really, <laughs> you really whip flags. You really <laughs> doing it nicely. Hang on. Hang on. Yeah. I've so what else we got, gentlemen? Yeah, we've got Dave Van Herpen. Dave, 
Say hello. So, so I had to, had to get it unmuted. Hi, guys. You got that? Yeah. Was well, on the panel then. Let's 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 go through, go through rounds. We have Peter, Dave, yeah. and then we've got Jan Willem Middleberg. Good morning, everyone. Hello, hello. I'm just checking whether I've done my technical stuff properly, and then I'll be giving you my 100% attention. So there you go. Give an IT person a piece of technology, and that's it. They're lost. Rather the conversation. There. Yeah. Oh, maybe maybe I could delegate this to to Tessa or Zoe. Could you just check whether I've got the got the stream copied to the um, the TFT site? I think I have. Right. Now I'm back in the back in the call. Sorry about that, everybody. And finally. Ah, wonderful! You got your camera, your wonderful new webcam, working, Mr. Kist. Yes, hello. So uh, I think it's working now, and I think you can hear me as well. Yeah, and that nasty little smudge in the middle of your your previous camera—that's vanished completely. So it's that's wonderful. That's my face, Mark. That's my face. <laughs> that's your face. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear me! Oh dear me! Well, thank you for introducing us. That was really introduction, wasn't it? it was well, more of a, a stumbling set of words. <laughs> well, you got it. You got us going. We're very grateful for you. So, <laughs> so thanks. So, it being seven minutes after nine in the UK, I am going to just introduce our session very briefly and then pass on the mic to our panelists to shortly introduce themselves. So let me share my screen with you. Hey, that's working. Yeah, have we got that? Okay. So this is about Dutch people and what foreign people think of us, but in particular is about what people think about Dutch IT people. Because we talk about strange things like Beheer, which Dave is going to talk about later on, and our famous polder model. By the way, the Dutch are very keen not strangely enough, models seem to be some kind of export product of the Dutch. And you'll see down the bottom, uh, going Dutch, of course, um, famous way of doing things, and we're even going to talk about the easygoing Dutch the relaxed kind of way that Dutch people do things. And the fascinating topic of informatie voorziening. So that's what we're going to talk about, but I just thought I'd, I'd introduce you to um, uh, Holland, uh, the Netherlands, and the Dutch people with a little video clip. Welcome to the great nation of Holland, where the tulips grow, the windmills turn, the breakfast is chocolatey, the people industrious, and the sea tries to drown it all. Except this country isn't Holland. It's time for the difference between Holland, the Netherlands, and a whole lot more. The correct name for this tulip growing, windmill building, Hagelslag eating, container ship moving, ocean conquering nation is the Netherlands. But confusion is understandable. The general region has been renamed a lot over a thousand years, including as the Dutch Republic, the United States of Belgium, and the Kingdom of Holland. But it's not just history that makes this country's name confusing, because the Netherlands is divided into 12 provinces. Groningen, Venta, Overhessel, Helderland, Limburg, Noord-Brabant, Zeeland, which, by the way, is the Zeeland that makes this Zeeland new, Friesland, with adorable little hearts on its flags, Flevoland, Utrecht, and here's the confusion, Noord, North Holland, and Zuid South Holland. These provinces make calling the Netherlands Holland like calling the United States Dakota. Though, unlike the Dakotas, which are mostly empty, save for the occasional jackalope, the two Hollands are the most populated provinces and have some of the biggest attractions, like Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Chances are, if it's Dutch and you've heard of it, it's in one of the Hollands. Even the government's travel website for the country is Holland.com, officially because it sounds friendlier, but unofficially, it's probably what people are actually searching for. Confusion continues because people who live in the Hollands are called Hollanders, but all citizens of the Netherlands are called Dutch, as is their language. But in Dutch, they say, Nederlands, sprekende Nederlanders in Nederland, which sounds like they'd rather we call them Netherlanders, speaking Netherlandish. Meanwhile, next door in Germany, they're Deutsche Sprechen Deutsch in Deutschland, which sounds like they'd rather be called Dutch. 
This linguistic confusion is why Americans call the Pennsylvania Dutch Dutch, even though they're Germans. To review, this country is the Netherlands, its people are Dutch, and they speak Dutch. There is no country called Holland, but there are provinces of North and South Holland. Got it? Great, because it's about to get more complicated. Well, we're going to leave it at that and get back to um, Dutch IT and how to speak it. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate to mention that the, that the Netherlands, Holland has got a Beheer professor. And sort of paying tribute to the guy who did a lot for the, um, for the industry in the Netherlands. And this wonderful academic length, 52 word definition of IT management. I'm not going to read out to you, but it's, um, it's certainly worthwhile taking a look at. And you can see, see how Google Translate deals with this. Back to the Dutch. We have lots of famous models like the ASL and BSL models. And the Negen Flux model, the Nine Cell model, which we're going to dive into a little bit later on in the session. And we also have these four top models who are going to introduce themselves. So, gents, with that, I'm going to relinquish control of my session and ask Peter first to introduce yourself. And please tell the audience, what is a line, sir? Okay, I'm going to use some, uh, some slides. Uh, can you see the slides, Mark? Mark? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. Um, line, sir, I, I, this is the pronunciation of my uh, last name, and I, uh, I wrote it down underneath there. It uh, doesn't matter, the easy pronunciation is just Peter. Um, it actually is a combination of the SE at the end of a name is normally son of, so this is uh, how this is um, uh, set up. Um, I've been in uh, service management since um, 1988 or the end of the 80s. Um, I did move to, um, uh, to Canada in 1997. Um, a lot of people actually always ask me, okay, why um, uh, did you move? And I hope this picture actually shows some of that. I like space and uh, maybe not as much the, uh, the enormous amount of people sometimes we, uh, we see. Um, I um, did my uh, idol exam in uh, 1992. Um, worked in that time for Pink Elephant, worked all the um, way till uh, 2000 for Pink Elephant. Then in 2000 to 2006, I worked for HP. And in 2006, I started up uh, Service Manager Art together with uh, two other partners. Um, I do consulting, training, instructor, um, I do all different kind of um, things. Um, I'm really excited actually uh, to be part of this uh, worldwide uh, ITSM community and uh, I'm especially excited to be part of the uh, TFT conference. Uh, this is my second time I did um, the first presentation uh, um, in, the, in the TFT 12. So that's it uh, from me and I'll just relinquish the... Uh, somehow. We should be back. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, sure. sure. You can hear me? Yep. All right. Okay, okay. so my name is uh, Dave von Herpen. And uh, I'm a uh, typical 70s child because I combined the rebellious 60s with a popular society from the 80s. I have to say I'm a sucker for Tarantino movies, or uh, any other movie in that respect. I love to play sports, like tennis, soccer, squash, golf, and the, and the occasional running. Uh, my educational background is international business. Did a European MBA some time ago. Um, have been working in IT for about 15 years now, mostly in uh, business process management, application management, service management, those kind of uh, lines of business. I also was a manager for a few years, but I kind of missed the intellectual challenge there, so no, no offense, guys. Um, for the past uh, 12 years, I've been working for Sojeti, which in Holland is actually pronounced the French way, Sojeti. I have done assignments for companies like Philips, um, a few banks like ING and Rabobank, a number of government agencies, so I'm pretty sure someone's watching us. And I am uh, certified in most of the frameworks like uh, ITIL, ASL, BISL, as uh, Mark just talked about, and also including ISO 20000. 
Um, but I'm also certified in Lean and Scrum. I regularly perform assessments and uh, lead improvement projects in these areas. Um, and uh, I've been involved with uh, uh, organizations like ITSMF Netherlands and other professional IT communities and several committees, uh, mostly regarding the organization of ITSM, ITSM events. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I love to visit and also like to organize. That's about it. Yeah, great, 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 great. And just, just following on the, um, the explanation of the family names, uh, what is Van Herpen? What does that mean? <laughs> well, uh, let me see. I'm, I'm back on my screen right, right now. Huh? I don't have a screen share anymore. Um, uh, Herpen actually is a small town in the ne in Netherlands, and that's uh, that's used a lot. So if if uh, someone has a van in between uh, the name, uh, in a lot of cases uh, behind it is a uh, small town in the Netherlands. So that's where you came from, where your family came um, from. Uh, uh, way back. Yeah, a long way. Uh, back. My ancestors. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay. Jan, Jan Willem. Jan next. Mark. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. By the way, we, uh, I th Dave, we missed your slides. So uh, are, are you going to use some slides, Jan Willem, to present yourself? Yeah, I think I might. OK, so I'll, con I'll confirm that they're visible when you get them up. Yep. Is this visible? Yes, sir. Well, first of all, thank you for having me at uh, TFD13. I think it's a very exciting platform um, to speak with a very large community around the world. Um, just a brief introduction about myself. Who am I? I'm responsible for Pink Elephant in the Netherlands. It's a company that uh, was away for quite some time, um, especially when it was taken over by Detronics. And we restarted in 2009, and I'm in charge of the education department. Um, I'm young, so I uh, still do a lot of sports, hockey, sailing particularly. Uh, my big dream is to uh, do the Olympics one day in, in, in a boat, and of course to win a, a medal. I studied at uh, Boston University, so uh, forgive my horrible uh, American accent. Um, <laughs> I do a lot of traveling, especially to uh, Asia and Africa, uh, where we also have another uh, a lot of uh, pink elephant companies. Um, I'm currently in the middle of Amsterdam, so it doesn't get much more Dutch than this. Um, still a lot of influence from the US though, so I read up on Time or in New Yorker uh, and do a little bit of wine and cooking in, uh, in the weekends. Any questions regarding that? Thank you. Well, of course, the uh, the question that you probably expected, what is a Middleburg? Well, that's actually a very interesting story. Uh, Middleburg is one of the, the capitals, it's, it's the capital of uh, Zealand, which is one of the provinces you sh showed us in the movie uh, a couple of minutes ago. So that's where my family is originally from, so they just named it after the town. Yeah, right. So it's just like Dave. Dave from Herpen. Yeah. Yep. And Jan Willem from Middleburg. Absolutely. Yeah, which takes us uh, takes us on nicely to Alexander. Um, so I guess that's Alexander from Kist, or am I mistaken? You're mistaken, mate. <laughs> yeah. Kist, Kist is actually, um, in, my, in my family's case, it's a coffin. My, uh, my, my ancestor used to be a coffin maker uh, when the Great Plague hit, so he was a very popular person, you can imagine. Yeah, what, what, what a wonderful family. Yeah, well, somebody has to do it. <laughs> All right, I'll show you. Do you need to make it? What? Do you need the radio mic? No, somebody does here. Sorry, take it over. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, you're seeing my PowerPoints now. Um, this is me, and it should show, that's my passport. So what I've been doing for the past uh, 25 years or so, um, I've been, first I worked for Pink Elephant for 20 years, 
Um, and then I became an interim manager consultant and I've uh, started two companies uh, since then. Uh, the present one is New School, uh, which I'm not going into today. Um, I've been in ITSM for uh, quite some time, um, 23 years actually, in three different countries. Um, I'm sort of proud of being uh, at the beginning of some, some of the stuff. Uh, we have to ask Peter later the number of his um, certificates, his, his service manager certificate. Uh, I saw that uh, he had it on. Let me just turn the sound down here. Um, there's a big echo. Um, so I've been doing all these things. I've uh, been a service manager since 1990. I have actually a degree in service management that is called Computer and Information Resources Management, which is probably why Pink Elephant sent me to the UK in 1990 to go and find out what I was really about. Um, I've been a trainer ever since, actually. Oh, is this our first technical glitch? Wonderful. We've lost it. Oh, well, it wasn't very interesting anyway. <laughs> let's, let's, well, let's, let's, go on to, let's go on to talking about something actually substantial. Peter, will you, uh, will you take, take the helm and, sure. give, and give, us your, give us your introduction to something vaguely related to Dutch IT? Sure. Um, I, I, by the way, I thought that we were skipping quite often between videos and uh, screen share, so we, uh, you might have to mute a few uh, people. Okay, uh, let me uh, put up the screen share. Are you seeing this? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. What I'm going to talk about is the Polder model which I call nowadays the uh, missing link in IT service management. Um, I'll explain what it is. I'll uh, and see how this can help uh, you with uh, you know, everyone who's working with some uh, IT service management effort. I'll start with some uh, definitions. Um, the Netherlands uh, consists partly of land reclaimed from the sea. Uh, these areas are called polders. They're below sea level. And that is, by the way, why the Netherlands is the tallest population in the world. We always want to make sure we can see over the dike, otherwise it's uh, we're too short, of course. A model is a system that can be used in this case for making decisions. It has nothing to do with modeling, because then it would look like um, something like this, and that's not what we're uh, really looking for. So, the Polder model. Is, in, um, is used in the decision-making uh, process. It's all about reaching decisions in consensus. Based on our history, we have to work together despite differences, and therefore it's a form of survival. Um, the polar model is embedded uh, in our political and economical environments, where all parties have a place at the table. But that's not the topic of this presentation, the political side. We have to look at it from an IT service management perspective, so let's start with some of the uh, history. The um, the Netherlands uh, largely, uh, like I said, consists of polders, which is uh, land regained from the sea. This requires constant uh, pumping, pumping and maintenance of the dikes. So ever since the Middle Ages, uh, different societies living in the same polder were forced to cooperate because about unanimous agreement on shared responsibility for maintenance of the dikes and pumping stations. The polders would have flooded and everyone would have suffered. Crucially, even when the different cities in the same polder were at war, they still had to cooperate in this respect. This is how the Polderman model started. The Dutch set aside their differences for a greater purpose. So what can we learn from this? Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about business relationship management and, uh, and design coordination. But so how can we use this model in our, our current environment? Um, let's look at ITIL. The British uh, started development of ITIL. The Dutch read it and recognized the implicit polder model in ITIL, so we started to market it to the rest of the world. Unfortunately, the polder model never has, was made explicit. This means the Anglo-Saxon culture had still difficulty in understanding this, and I'm going to provide you with some examples how it should work. Um, business relationship management um, in the ITIL book is referred to as a process or function, but it's actually an organizational uh, capability. The only way this process can be successful is if the polder model is used. So get everyone at the table to discuss what is best for the organization. 
This means talk to not only customers and users, but also your own IT organization, from operational people, the service desk, and to all the way to strategic uh, staff. Then you can make the right decisions for the organization. Now the second one is design coordination. Um, this is a shout out to Mark Kawasaki who uh, said um, design coordination is about controlling chaos. Why? Because we're herding cats. The main objective is about communication, involvement and understanding about the design. It requires a consensus decision making that's best for the organization, not working in silos. You cannot be at war with your different IT groups. You have to work together for the common good. And that's where we actually start seeing this folder model, of course. So this is how the, uh, the Dutch use the polder model. When everyone has a seat at the table, we make decisions that are good for the organization. Um, I wanted to um, um, finish with a slide um, that I, um, is based on a tweet from yesterday. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll just uh, show that. Uh, this is a slide from Rob England, and decided to shout out to him. So, um, But with this, uh, back to you, uh, Mark, and I'll uh, stop the slide share. Great, thank you very much. Passing, con that was very interesting. Passing control to Dave. Okay, okay. Uh, let me see if I can really screen share my screen now. I suppose this is better. Yeah, can you see my uh, slides now? That's great. Okay. Well, um, what I'd like to talk to you about is a uh, renowned and um, uh, I would say uh, an immaculate Dutch word. We call it uh, beheer. Now, pronouncing it quickly might sound like I'm craving for a cold glass of beer. Uh, beer, but that's not what I'd like to talk to you about. In the Dutch language, we have uh, two separate words for, uh, for which the English only have one, which is the word management. Uh, first, we use the, term, the same term management for the people directing and leading and steering the organization. And second, uh, we use the word beheer as a combination of first, uh, the business and uh, information management and support, second, uh, the application management and IT operations. So it's a combination of a number of competences. Now, um, and that's quite handy for us because we're talking about one word that uh, combines the operations and support activities for IT. Uh, I think that's pretty great. Uh, the Beheer model uh, by uh, Mark mentioned him already, the well respected Dutch ITSM hero uh, Martin Lawyer, uh, the professor. He explains the three Beheer objects, which are fundamental to his work and to a lot of uh, things that have been derived from it in our profession. So here you see the, uh, as you might say, the three balls of the professor. Um, first, on the left, you see uh, functional management, and that includes uh, user management, uh, things like uh, functional maintenance, uh, sort of, uh, the articulation and the funneling of the business demand. And second, on the right bottom, you see application management. This comprises application and database support, uh, maintenance of the applications, application lifecycle management, etc. And third, on the right top, you see technical management. And that contains things like operational management, uh, uh, maintenance of the technical infrastructure and other technical services. So uh, the functional management, they represent the users and uh, business stakeholders. And SLAs, they are formed to, to match and to articulate the demand uh, and, and match, match the demand with the supply of IT. And service management might be positioned as the role or function that articulates and combines and ensures the delivery of the services from the, from the back end. Um, uh, this originates from combining the different components, uh, the, the ingredients for the internal, from the internal and external suppliers. And next to that, service management 
um, also takes care of the organization and optimization of all processes throughout the IT service chain. And that enables the required value and outcomes for the IT customers by taking care of costs and risks. So VOCR, and I'm sure that our semi-Dutch uh, countryman Paul Wilkinson is uh, going to love to hear this. Um, now, th this Beheer model is already old, uh, the three balls, uh, but it's so fundamental to everything that has come from Dutch IT people in the past 20 years that I just, uh, I had to draw your attention to this. Now, in line with this model, um, we see this one. It's also based on the uh, strategic alignment model of Henderson and Van, Van Katraman, uh, where a, uh, a number of Dutch and also some uh, semi-Dutch, or uh, what we call Belgian, researchers, um, among which the, the uh, well-respected uh, Professor Rick Maas, they came with this nine-cell model, which we call a Negen Flux model. Uh, I think it, it definitely illustrates the, the, the collaboration between business and IT, and the, uh, the different organizational levels. It positions the information management domain as, as sort of the glue between, on the one hand, the business goals, and on the other hand, IT execution. And so um, uh, what it does, it combines, it combines a drive on the customer side for customer intimacy, uh, like BRM, uh, with the drive for operation, operational excellence in the back end, in the IT, which is also the well-known squeeze for us uh, service management people. Now, the, the best models, in my view, they are very simple. Huh? And I think this is one that's very simple as well. So that might be exactly why this is a very handy one to use. That's what I would like to talk to you about for this one. Let me give it back now. Okay. Great, yeah, that's wonderful. You touched on some really fundamental stuff there. It's really the you know the, the hard stuff of IT, um, which is a ni nice segue to uh, young Willem, who's going to talk more about the soft side, more about the cultural aspects of the Dutch. So yes. take it away. Thank you very much. So let's try to share my screen again. Is it up? Not yet. Oh yes. So we did the introductionary stuff and what I will be talking about in the next couple of minutes is the Dutch uh, famous saying that we have that is made that the cat wise. It's frequently used um, and uh, I'm pretty sure in the Netherlands everybody knows what it is but around the globe it's, uh, it's very unknown. So what I will do in this uh, five minute presentation is elaborate a little bit on what does the saying mean and more importantly, of course, how does that relate to IT? And you already touched a little bit about the soft skills. And that's what I will be discussing um, to the audience today. Um, and of course, we are also very fond of models. And uh, we have another Dutch model, which elaborates on that uh, quite extensively. It's also devised by a famous Dutch guy, but I'll touch about that uh, in a couple of minutes. So make that the cat wise. What does that actually mean? Um, it is a, a very old Dutch saying, and um, if you're literally translated, it would be saying something like "Make the cat believe that." Um, we use it a lot, um, and that's also why we think it's it's the easy way um, of considering IT, because a lot of people are shouting a lot of different things, different models, different uh, ideas all claiming that that will be the best for their business. Um, and if we then, as Dutch say, make that the cat wise, we actually say, or well, we, we don't actually believe a word you're saying. Um, we looked online for uh, some translations, and I think that the most, uh, the one that comes most close is something like tell that to the Marines, which I never heard of before, but I'm pretty sure the uh, American or English audience Never heard of uh, make that the cat wise. So next question, of course, is how does that relate to IT? Um, if you look at a little bit of the history of ITSM in particular, uh, we have introductions of uh, well, 
over a dozen of frameworks, each claiming that they have best practices and ways to optimize organizations. The ones that I think are most famous at this moment are ITIL and ISO 20K for service management in particular, and you have the models for PRINCE2 and PMI for project management, and of course a, a, a most organizations at this moment are leaning towards lean and agile models in, order, in a way to optimize their organization again. So the big question at this moment is, will a change or additional models help us solve our next problems? Well, what we would say in, in Dutch is something like, make that the capitalize. We don't believe anything about, around that. Because if we look at the results of all these kind of, of models, um, we have been using them for the past 30 years. So I think that, generally speaking, we should have been optimized almost completely uh, within those years. Um, however, if you look to, uh, to surveys, and uh, these uh, kind of numbers are frequently published around the globe in different reports, um, it is a fact that 73% of ITSM projects still fail. They're either over time or over budget, and I think um, with all the models in place, we're still not able um, to reduce that number. As a result, the business, and I think uh, we had a very interesting model discussed a couple of minutes ago with the nine flux model, but the business frequently does not see the value of their investments in ITSM projects, which, and that is, of course, always the end result, results in dissatisfied staff and dissatisfied customers. So if you ask how will a, a change or even an additional uh, model help us to solve our problems, I would say again, make that the cat wise. So what to do? Um, luckily, we have another great Dutch thinker. You already mentioned Martin van Lawyer, but we also have a very influential guy, a Dutch guy here whose name is Paul Wilkinson, and who devised um, uh, the soft side of IT, and he called that the ABC of ICT, where A stands for attitude, B stands for behavior, and C stands for culture. And I think that this is also a very Dutch uh, uh, development because, um, well, first of all, it's, it's, uh, it's thought of by, by a Dutch guy. And second of all, it's also the, the easy or light version of um, Beheer or IT service management in particular. We're all focusing on models uh, a lot but we should also look at the people who actually use it and the way they treat their organizations. So I'm going to explain and dive a little bit deeper into the different soft sides of uh, what those ABCs are um, in, in fact. And basically what Paul devised is that there are three main components which you should take into account in any improvement projects, regardless of the model. So whether it's ASL, BSL, ITIL, or PRINCE2, there are also soft skills and soft components that come into play when um, improving an organization. And according to the research he did, most of uh, ITSM projects fail because these soft sides or soft skills are not taken into account. So if we come back to attitude, um, this is basically what people uh, think and feel. And if you can see on the little cartoon on the right, um, people um, frequently say one thing and um, actually mean another. Um, so attitude is really how people react to change initiatives, colleagues or, or customers. The second main component that people should take into account is behavior. Behavior is influenced by attitude, of course, but it, in fact it is what people actually do on a day-to-day -day fashion. So I always like the cartoon on the right here a bit saying, uh, well, you have my full commitment apart from time, money, effort, and just as long as I don't have to be involved, which is a, uh, a frequent problem in, uh, in IT projects is that from the top down, there is no uh, commitment. 
So people say they will do something and say they will give commitment to a, s a certain project, but in the end they don't, and that's also one of the key reasons why a lot of improvement initiatives fail. The last and um, also very important aspects of the ABC is, the, is C, which stands for culture, and that is basically the, the fabric and fashion of the organization and the way they treat their employees, but also uh, the environment, and it really defines uh, what the organization is and how they work. It defines their values, their standards, and they, the way they like to be seen in, um, uh, in the outside world. So you have uh, organizations what, which in the core have very customer-focused approaches, and on the other hand, you see that there are also uh, um, companies who do not have that in their veins, as you can see on the cartoon at the right, where people are saying that it's not my responsibility and uh, will place the responsibility elsewhere. So I think that those are three very defining uh, and very good additions to all the existing IT models uh, in the world. Um, so wrapping up this topic, I think, uh, will ABC be a new model? No, it's, it's meant as an addition uh, on different factors that you need to take into account when uh, doing any improvement project. Um, and it will definitely not be a new model, but a, a new mindset. So if you say it would be a, um, a new model, the Dutch way of saying it would be make that the cat wise. Thank you very much, Mark. Back to you. Thank you, sir. That was wonderful. Excellent. And now we're going to uh, have a listen to our last speaker. And then we're going to have about 10 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes for a general discussion. Um, so, Mr. Alexander Coffin, <laughs> would you kindly share your wisdom with us? Hello, yes. Um, if my computer doesn't crash again, apologies for that, by the way, um, I will show you my screen again. And that is going up now. There you go. So, um, what I want to talk to you guys about for about five minutes, that is, is about click get in touch with the Dutch. It's uh, Dutch IT is smart IT. Um, I'm moving away from the models a little bit. I think we've heard more than enough about models in this uh, particular hour. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss with you the going Dutch in IT. And uh, I think that's a term that most uh, English speaking people definitely understand. It's actually um, perceived as a negative by most Dutch people. Uh, I don't know if that's correct, if, if that's good, a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but going Dutch is, uh, of course, is when you uh, go out with somebody or with a group of people and you all, you all pay your own share of the food and drink. Um, and that's something that we actually do in Holland. And if you look it up on Wikipedia, a lot of other uh, peoples do it as well. But it's still called going Dutch. Um, so going Dutch in IT, I think, uh, it applies to um, the, um, the practice of bring your own device, which is basically um, a way of, uh, of sharing the cost of IT between the user and the company that they work for. Um, and what you see is that when uh, mobile phones for work came up, that most people were allowed and are still allowed to use their, um, their, their work phone to make private calls. In fact, I think there are very few people nowadays that have two phones. But right? it's also because the cost has gone down, of course, but also it's a bit of a perk, like the company car is you're expected to be allowed to, um, to use your private phone. Um, and then, of course, when smartphones came up, uh, companies were reluctant to start uh, giving people smartphones. So people started bringing their own and they started logging into the uh, company Wi-Fi. And then tablets came up and people started bringing their own tablets and connect those to the company Wi-Fi. And uh, on the one hand, they were, of course, um, still making private use of company infrastructure. But more than that, they were now more than they had more capability to work. Um, they had more capability to work outside of hours, and they had more capability to work uh, at home, so uh, in different locations. Um, that in itself led to um, the, necess the necessity for a better corporate security. 
And I was um, reading about this and I came across an article on ZDNet by uh, Larry Dignan, who I have actually not asked uh, permission to use his graph, but I've put a link to it uh, at the bottom. So if you want to look at it, it's obviously his. They did some research and basically what they researched was that um, br bring your own doesn't actually cost the company very much. If you look here, you see that about 50% of the uh, people that bring their own devices uh, basically get no money at all reimbursed for uh, the use of, uh, of the, um, uh, the internet uh, capability. Uh, no expenses and uh, definitely no reimbursement for the equipment itself. Um, another um, so it's been t sort of 43% uh, uh, over here, they get uh, some reimbursement, but not all of it, and only 7% get uh, full reimbursement. Now, of course, there's, uh, I don't know the statistical value of this, but it feels about right, which means that uh, a lot of people are bringing their own devices to the company, and um, in actual fact, they're paying for that themselves. Um, and also, um, the company is providing them with uh, stuff like a desktop virtualization, which is ex experts on the internet tell us is the, uh, um, the best way of doing security in the case of uh, using unsecure equipment. Um, so when companies have better security uh, and, and through desktop virtualization, for example, um, the possibilities for off-site and out-of-hours working are, of course, greatly increased. So what you start seeing is people start bringing their own devices. Um, they are paying a large amount of the cost themselves. And um, they are also working more hours. So this is sort of the, the going Dutch aspect is going a little bit the other way. It's like um, your employer is taking you out for a party and then you pay for yourself and also for the employer. Um, I think that's going for a little bit too far. So I think the, the going Dutch in actual fact is a very good principle to apply to um, the, uh, the bring your own device uh, issue. Um, and I definitely don't think we should be building any models around that other than just um, people pay for their own stuff if they want to. And if they don't want to, you give them a phone that, ring, that, that, that you can phone with and you give them a laptop or even a desktop. Um, and they can work with that and no problem there. So um, I think I'll leave it at that and I'll see if I can come back in the flesh. Mark. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Isn't that wonderful? You've kidnapped Bring Your Own Device and called it a Dutch invention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure a Dutchman did it first. <laughs> yeah. It's like nobody knows the CD is actually a Dutch invention. Is that right? Or the DVD. It was, it was invented by Philips in Eindhoven. Yeah, yeah well, fancy that. Fancy that. It's yeah. like the British say they invented ITIL, which is not true, and then the Dutch say that we... <laughs> In the end, the U.S. will take credit for everything. Yeah, as they always do. Yeah, we've got guys. We've got about five minutes to go before we're going to round off the session. So um, uh, let's see. Let's just have a free format discussion. Anybody? Does anybody want to? Well, I'm just looking at the at the Twitter stream. I think the most um, most interesting comment was on all, all the sexy foreign voices. <laughs> isn't, isn't that great? Somebody commented, where, asked where my tiara was. <laughs> Some, yeah, I, no. yeah, I was wondering about that as well, Mark. Yeah, yeah. And there's even even Simone Moore. She's even learning to speak Dutch. Wonderful! Congratulations. I think that's very wise, actually. I hear, I hear that a lot of uh, Americans now that are teaching their children Mandarin because they're afraid the Chinese are going to actually take over their country. I think everybody should be learning Dutch. Um, <laughs> you, you know what happened in the, um, um, in the Golden Age? They, they, of course, the British went and conquered the world and pushed their language onto everybody, which is why we're now speaking English. Whereas the Dutch were much smarter. They just learned everybody else's and then conquered the world after the English. <laughs> So, Alexander, do you have plans to conquer the world, or...? Always, always, yeah. World domination is my purpose. Is, is, is this the part where you're going to say that you want to reinvent slavery, then? Uh, no, that's, I, I, don't, I don't like that very much. I think um, I should be paid for working. <laughs> 
But the other thing that Dutch, uh, I mean, in the, um, I think it was the beginning of the 90s, if you wanted to be anything with ITIL, etc., you had to be able to speak Dutch. There were, so there were most of the consultants that actually were well known were, um, uh, were also able to actually speak Dutch. So that's, um, it's, it's, it's all embedded in there. We, we slowly take over, absolutely. It's a revenge for New York. Yes. That was only one buck, was it? Yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we have Dinklish, right? So no, it's Dunglish. Oh, Dunglish. Dunglish, Dunglish yeah. 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 That's what we're talking now, yeah. Yeah, it's not that bad, guys. Not that bad. Who has any, any substantial comments to make on one of the topics? First, we had the, the Polder model. Do you, do you recognize that as, success, as a successful way of collaborating? Well, I think that, um, in general speaking, it is a very successful model, and it's been around for, for years. It's also uh, used frequently in politics. Um, there are, are positive sides, but also, I think, uh, a couple of negative sides to it, because um, it's good to always speak to everyone and, and find a consensus. On the other hand, uh, it also becomes very difficult to make good and sharp decisions where you need to um, discuss everything with everyone all the time. I think it's a good point, actually. I mean, um, there's a time for talking and there's a time for taking decisions. And I think one of the not so good traits of the Dutch is that we try to uh, basically discuss everything to death uh, rather than just taking action. That's why we're going to take the whole hour here instead of 45 minutes. <laughs> you want uh, you want to get to bed, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, let's move on to Dave's topic. Dave talked about some very fundamental stuff. The 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 comment I'd like, yeah. comment I'd like to make on that um, is you made very explicit the demand supply divide between uh, you know in, in IT management you've got business people on the demand side IT guys on the supply side. What I am emphasizing more and more is that it's not just demand and supply, it's demand, supply and use. With the emphasis on use, which might be the weakest link, because we spent millions on making these systems, but if the users don't use the systems as they're meant to be used, you're not realizing the value. So that's, um, that, that's uh, certainly the, the comment I'd like, like to make on that. Demand, supply and use. Is possibly yeah. a new paradigm from the, I, from the paradigmologist. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I also think that the demand supply is um, sometimes misused in a lot of cases, where you see that um, demand supply is used to uh, to put an additional organization between the business and, and IT, uh, where uh, you also might say that they're from the same organization. So why uh, put put any more? Uh, 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 roles or functions or whatever in between it. Uh, if, if, if you put it in the right way, uh, whether you call it a retained organization or what we call a regie organization, that's also a brilliant Dutch word, um, then, uh, th then you really might have a lot of benefits of outsourcing your IT to uh, external parties and uh, still, gaining con uh, still gaining control over it. Like right. functional management is very essential in um, those kind of things. Yeah, well, we could talk about that for hours. So, um, so let's leave leave that for the next TFT session. Uh, any comments on Jan Willem's attitude, behavior, culture? Well, I suppose it was really. Good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you you thought it was brilliant, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think Paul Wilkerson thought it was brilliant as well. Yeah, Paul, I don't, Paul hadn't seen it. I'm looking at oh. the Twitter feed. He, he hasn't picked up on it yet, but he will do. No, that's really, really essential, really essential. And Mr. Kist, your talent for, for kid, kidnapping, for making everything of world domination, making everything Dutch, I envy you. Oh, you should be. Um, <laughs> I, I think, though, I mean, um, uh, obviously there was a, a point in uh, putting a little... A little fun in it to uh, not make it all too boring and not too much about models. Um, but I think there's a there's a definite point to the uh, whole bring your own issue in terms of service management because it's I think it's it's changing the landscape in a very significant way. 
And uh, I, I think it's important to realize that, uh, that, that people are going to be bringing their own stuff in more and more. Yeah, I reckon it's one of the one of the many disruptive forces which are sort of redefining our our battlefield. I think I definitely think so. It's it's, it's um, you want people to do this, and you want people to start working at home, for example, and they will be using their own equipment. It's it's like what we're doing now. And I'm actually living proof, having a, a blue screen of death before, that um, you, you need to you need to manage that from the perspective of the company. I didn't do that on purpose, but it actually was an excellent example. Guys, we've got to wrap it up. I thank you so much for your time, for your effort in preparing this. Really great, really great. Patrick, do you want to... Um, uh, yeah, I suppose. I, the, one, yeah. the one thing, I, I didn't know everything was invented in the Netherlands, so I, I didn't know the entire IT world was actually Dutch. But uh, make that the cap wise is about all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I reckon there's, there's no better way to close. There's no better way to close, <laughs> close than that. So, guys, thank you so much again. Peter, thanks especially for staying up so late. It's now three o'clock in the morning in Canada. Yep. So, uh, have a, have a, I hope you don't have an early morning tomorrow. Uh, no, I'm uh, not doing that. <laughs> okay, great. We're going off the air. Three, two, Thanks, guys. one.